Hi, and welcome to another episode of Musings. Today's episode is very interesting because it is titled From Soldier to Scholar. I have with me somebody unique who made that transition from army to literary studies in academia. Welcome, Professor Masood Raja. He is an associate professor of English at University of North Texas. He's the author of ISIS, Ideology, Symbolics, and Counter Narratives, by Rutledge, 2019. The Religious Right and Palibanization of America, 2016. Constructing Pakistan from Oxford, 2010. Dr. Raja specializes in post-colonial studies, globalization theory, and the study of Islamic cultures and politics. His critical essays have been published in various journals, such as the South Asian Review, Caribbean Studies, South Asia, Journal of South Asian Studies, Mosaic, Radical Teacher, and others. Dr. Raja has also co-edited two collections of essays, served on the PMLA Advisory Committee, and has recently won and finished administering a $1 million Department of State grant as the director of UNT NUML partnership, a three-year cooperative government uh, agreement, excuse me, between UNT and National Universities of Modern Languages in Pakistan. Dr. Raj's next book, Democratic Criticism, Poetics of Incitement and the Muslim Sacred, will be soon published by Lever Press. He has also recently started his own channel called The Postcolonial Space, which I believe also has garnered more than 10,000 uh, viewers and subscribers. I think the correct number is around 16,000 and growing. I am encouraging all viewers to take a look at that channel on YouTube also. And we will talk about that um, space that you have created. Welcome, Dr. Masood Raja. Thank you so much, first of all, Amrita Ji, for giving me this chance to have a conversation with you. And I'm really delighted to be here. So I want to start with this very interesting trajectory from soldier to scholar. You were, um, not many people know, an army officer in Pakistan and then made a shift to academia, a turn that most of us cannot imagine, let alone embark upon. You also have mentioned in your own channel that this particular period of your life, and I'm quoting you, has been one of the most formative experiences in your life, end quote. Why did you specifically choose literary studies from that backdrop in the army? And if you can talk to us about this transition from a military experience into academia in the US. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's a really important question because it's a question uh, of self, right? How do we become who we are? And yes, I mean, I was an infantry officer and I was a career officer. I was, uh, you know, commanding an infantry company when I left the army. So I wasn't even like in an ancillary branch of the army. I was in the fighting force. So I think what, what enabled me to make the transition was was in a way, and the reason I call it the most formative experience of my life was because, you know, the army had incorporated me within its system pretty early. So in Pakistan, we have uh, several institutions, but the most established farm school, as we say it in the United States, for future military officers is what is called military college Jalem. It used to be called the King George, George's Royal Military School, and it was established in 1922. There were two schools established, one in Jhelum and the other in Dehradun, right? And so what these schools did was that they would take in eighth graders, right, kids in eighth grade, and give them a, a scholastic education Right, But along with that, they would also give them some training in military discipline and sort of like military way of thinking. And the idea was that you would be brought in in eighth grade and you'll be given a free room and board and free education. 
So that was the first part, because even though it was a military school, we had some highly qualified professors there. I went in in 1978, so our professors were mostly from the first generation of, you know, Aligarh. These were all PhDs and masters and MPhils from Aligarh University. They had been part of the Pakistan movement and they were pretty secular in their worldview. So out of them, the two, Professor Saeed Rashid was our professor of English, Professor Anuddin Alvi taught Urdu, but they didn't just teach the subject, they encouraged in us a habit of reading, a habit of thinking and writing. And then at that time, Pakistan military had a junior military academy where they would accept cadets after 10th grade. Now, all of this had to be after intensive tests and interviews and everything. It was a highly selective process. So I got my 10th grade, which you, we used to call matriculation, right, in the old parlance. And then I went into junior military academy, did two years of training there, and then two years of training in the senior military academy, and then became a second lieutenant. But throughout that process, because of the boarding school experience, the thing that I internalized was like a reading habit. I would constantly be reading something outside of syllabus and all. And it's that reading habit that I carried through. So when I joined the army as an officer, I was lucky enough to go into a battalion which had highly educated officers. Now remember both the Indian army and Pakistan army, it's sort of modeled on the British army model. And in the British Army model, like the old model, the officers were trained as professionals, but also as gentlemen, as people who had some taste and who could appreciate art. So when I went into my battalion, you know, the first meeting that I had with my second in command, he gave me a list of 100 books that I was supposed to read in the first year. And those included like, you know, books by Clausewitz, but also Toynbee's history of the study of history, some popular novels, War and Peace. It was like a hodgepodge of literary and historical and military texts. And the second thing that was important was that in Pakistan army, you weren't really derided for being literary or for being able to write or read. Those were actually considered as extra attributes of an officer and they would help you excel at your profession. So, you know, as I developed my military career along with it, I also constantly kept reading and kept developing my reading and writing skills. So when I left Pakistan Army, that was in 1996. And for family reasons, I had to come to United States. And the easiest time then, I, I don't know if you're aware, the easiest way of coming to United States then, if you had the resources, was to come as, as, a, as an international student, right? So I applied and got into Belmont University uh, they didn't accept my military academy degree as a terminal, as a, as a full bachelor's. So I had to do two years of undergraduate work, which I find it to be a blessing, you know, because that gave me the undergraduate experience, but I was also able to take the first year writing classes, the Western Civ classes. And so when I was deciding my major you know, I had all the intentions of going back to Pakistan at that time. And I met my advisor and uh, I was planning to build a school in Pakistan, which I still might do someday. And so I was an education major. But, you know, as an education major, I had to have, a, what do you call it, a, an academic major, which I chose to be English. And the reason I chose it to be English was because you know, I loved reading and writing. So that was like a no brainer. So she, I sat with my advisor, Dr. Abhi Pinter, and she said, well, what are your plans? Do you want to teach uh, high school or do you want to be a college professor? So I asked her, I was like, what if I want to be a college professor? 
And she said, well, then you don't need to be an education major because that requires an extra 64 hours for you to graduate. Just become an English major and then get your bachelor's, your master's and your PhD, and then you can become a professor. So that was the pragmatic aspect of it. So I became an English major. But by and large, I think the love of reading and writing and literature was already there even when I was in the army. But through the advising that I received, it became very easy for me to decide that this is where my strengths lie. This is what I want to do. And that's why I ended up studying literature. You make academia sound almost easy. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but I want to stay on this topic of academia and specifically literary studies. Um, and when I myself studied literature long ago as an undergrad in India, um, it was English literature, the Department of English. Um, and I still remember how gendered the classroom used to be almost three quarters of the classroom was uh, filled with women students, barely a couple of male students. Um, and it also at that time was sort of looked down upon. Um, perhaps one had taken up honors in English because one had nothing better to qualify for. Something around that kind of uh, a sentiment was there. And do you think in South Asia specifically, um, with Pakistan in your experience has had a different or similar trajectory with English studies? And do you think it's different in the West or has it been when it comes to gender and literary studies specifically? I think it's like India and Pakistan, of course, you know, have a similar trajectories in terms of how education and English was introduced there. Uh, I think in Pakistan still, predominantly it still is heavily uh, a field in which mostly women enter and study. So they outnumber the men, even at the level of PhDs right now. And I don't think so it is looked down upon in Pakistan because somehow, at least in the bourgeois culture of Pakistan, not just knowing English and knowing uh, its ways of reading, it's sort of considered a cultural cachet uh, to a point where it is kind of a fetish. And that if you can somehow affect a British accent, you're even found to be cooler. You know, all those colonial legacies that we have, that is still there. But I think increasingly English studies in Pakistan also has now become uh, more detached from its colonial legacy and has started developing sort of maybe an indigenous way of doing English studies by focusing more on maybe regional literatures, by focusing more on Pakistani literature in English and, and South Asian literature. So that's the trajectory I see over there. But here too, if you look at our American classrooms, if you count the number of majors in English, it also, the numbers are skewed towards women and less men tend to study it. I don't know what's the reason for it, but I don't think so if anyone now would consider it maybe as an inherently female field of study or discipline, but that the numbers are still there. I mean, about 10 years ago, if you looked at the elementary school teachers figures, 87% of elementary school teachers were women in the United States. Uh, now, I don't know the cultural and other reasons for it, but increasingly in Pakistan, I think the more elite an institution is, the more Anglophile they tend to be because people still take pride in, you know, no, studying English literature in Pakistan by and large still is British literature, right? And then towards the end of your career in your bachelor's degree, they were like, now you can either write an essay or take an American lit course. So it's like, when you say I'm studying English, you're basically studying British literature and it is privileged. Uh, so those are my thoughts on, uh, uh, 
how it is developing in Pakistan. Mm. But I think in the last 10 years, and I think India is far ahead of Pakistan in that, in the last 10 years, uh, there has been development in increasing and repla- replacing the old curriculum with something that has to do something with post-colonial studies and South Asian studies. And those trends are there. Mm. Um, this next question is a larger question. And you know, you do post-colonial studies. I also am a scholar in post-colonial studies of studying literature from South Asia and film. And there seems to be a consistent critique, and it has been around, it's not something new, uh, that literature has become too political. What happened to the aesthetics part of it? Um, And obviously that has come to post-colonial literature more and more. And my immediate brief reaction is why not? And why do we need to separate those two things out? Um, And why not politics? But I wanna hear from you what you think of this particular critique of post-colonial studies as being too political and literature deviating from that art and aesthetics and becoming too political? That's really a very interesting question because the thing about post-colonial studies is it gets critiques from both sides, right? So for some, we are too political. And for the left, especially the Marxist left, we are too culturalist and too conservative, right? And if you now go into the decolonial studies, we are part of the project of empire anyway. Okay. And what's interesting in that is that everyone has an opinion about post-colonialism, right? <laughs> but they always imagine this singular post-colonialism, right? So if they are criticizing it from the right, it's all about, it's too political, it's too much about identity politics, it's too thin. It, people who do post-colonial studies don't really know how to read text and you feel the text and write about it, right? Because they are too much focused on the politics of the text. And when you go to the left, their argument is, oh, post-colonialism, they are too esoteric, they are too structuralist, they don't care about class and all. But in all the cases, they choose their own definition of what constitutes post-colonialism, which is the biggest promise of post-colonialism, right? Because I can go to decolonial studies people and say, hey guys, we have been doing this all along, okay? What do you think we do when we read Fanon, right? Or Césaire, right? Isn't that decolonial studies, right? Uh, We can incorporate Walter Manvolo in our own repertoire of theory, right? And to answer the larger question of it is be, it is too political, I think that comes not from any problem with the field itself, but from the insecurities of these people who have a privileged view of what con- constitutes the literary and literary studies. And they are increasingly losing ground, not in scholarship, but also in terms of where our students are. I mean, we are teaching students in the United States of America. Okay, about a week ago, I was discussing something. And instead of using the they pronoun, I used what I thought was a very liberal use of he or she, right? Which we were trained to do. And a student later corrected me by saying, Dr. Raja, you are being too binary, right? And, And the student was right, because I should be aware of where the language is, right? Now, if we just did the aesthetics of the text and not the politics within which the text is produced and then consumed, we will already be anachronistic and archaic, right? So I think part of the criticism that basically suggests that post-colonialism is somehow too political, it's coming from people who are one, afraid of staying abreast of what political debates are right now here in the United States, but also elsewhere in the world, they realize that their work increases if you have to keep tabs on where the language is, where our students are, because it's always easy to teach seven great books of literature and just appreciate, you know, how the poem kind of moves and how it, how John Donne somehow can, 
take on the persona of the divine and express it in three you know stanzas so so i think it has got nothing to do with post colonialism being too political but rather the anxieties of the people who see that as a threat to their to their own way of doing things now in terms of post colonial scholarship yours mine and our major scholars i mean none of them just does a cursory reading of of the text right i mean if you read even even homi baba's reading of the text i mean these are deep readings they require not just a political reading of the text but also how others have read it yeah. i mean part of the burden of being a post colonialist isn't just that i get to write about salman rushdi right or anyone else it is also i have to read how it has been received by others right and we have to incorporate that in our writing yeah. so i don't really buy this whole idea that lit- literary studies should not be political i mean we live in politics politics impacts our life our students by and large are deeply politically active they think in political terms so if we force upon them just an aesthetic model of reading we are actually doing them a disservice and we are forcing them to think in limiting and archaic terms right so that's my kind of convoluted response to that well, really interesting it's question it's really interesting um and i'm going to stay on this a little more with what is happening in the us um with critical race theory and it's suddenly in the suspect space and when it comes to post colonial studies as you rightly pointed out there is this critique from various different um sides but given that there is this critique of the field within itself do you think it is rightly uh, a moment to rethink where we are with the state of the field in post colonial studies and where do you see it what's your vision of it in the future of the field of post colonial studies well i mean if you look at the mla jobs right now for post colonialism there are two jobs and one fellowship right so the field has already kind of lost its luster that it had in the 90s and to the early 2000s and part of it is the reactionary response right uh, so the field has broadened other subfields of english studies so now people are looking for post colonialist scholars in medievalism and post colonial scholarism in shakespeare so we have altered those fields right but what was so fascinating about post colonialism and you obviously must have read the early essays that came out in 1982 by ella schwatt and ann mcclintock and others was that the term post colonial itself was a non threatening term yeah. right because you could sell it as as if it is safe right it wasn't anti colonialism or anti imperialism you were developing a course on post colonialism chances were most administrators would say oh good good you are at least assuming that colonialism is over right that was the beauty of the term because it was subtle enough to pass through those administrative hurdles and all so i think right now so there are challenges coming from the right right but challenges coming from the left have always been that we are not marxist enough right uh, but then that doesn't take into account that there are people who are marxist who work in post colonial studies and then from decolonial studies or indigenous studies I mean most of the people who are doing decoloniality or decolonial studies have actually read only 5 pages by Walter Manvolo in his you know famous book uh, on the darker side of moder- modernity but if you really have a conversation with them you realize that anything that they want decolonial studies to do we are doing that we are challenging the philosophical assumptions of western canon we are thinking differently but beyond that post colonial studies places itself in this ambivalent space where we are neither from the west nor from the east that is the ultimate promise of it of being in a place where we can 
we don't take sides. We can pick up anything from the right or from the left, from Europe, from India, right? And we can make it work. Now, I had pointed out in one of my video lectures that if you let decolonial studies devolve into this binaristic way of looking at the world, then the most tragic ways of thinking the world can be normalized. So if you are in India, right? What is Hindutva, right? It is juxtaposed. It is a purist idea of what constitutes the essential Indianness, And for that, you have to be Hindu. You have to follow a certain interpretation of the scripture. And anyone else who is outside of it is not Indian enough, right? That is decolonial studies within Indian context. If you go to Pakistan, what is decolonial studies? The Western history is wrong. The Western systems are wrong. Let's go and retrieve our own pure identity. And where are we going to go? We're going to go to 8th century and choose certain Islamic texts. So the history becomes Islamized or Hinduized, right? So the potential that post-colonial studies has is it has the potential of, of complicating any mainstream narrative coming from United States and elsewhere by juxtaposing against it local stories, local ways of thinking, narratives from India, from Africa, right? Yeah. Because we, we, we can change that and complicate it. And at the same time, we can create a space and say, hey, there is nothing wrong in reading Marx, right? Or Nancy Fraser and taking that thought and juxtaposing it or infusing our own local thought with it, right? And in that way, we can enrich our own culture Right, and we can indigenize this for foreign so-called literature. And I think post-colonial studies, because of its disciplinary imperatives, because we have to know the Western canon, we have to know the Western philosophy, because if we don't know it, we can't really challenge it, right? And then how do we challenge it with the knowledge that is not accessible to an average British or American scholar? That is the knowledge of our languages, knowledge of our cultures, our history. Mm -hmm. and, and that gives post-colonial studies this unique stance, right? a unique space from where to, to mobilize a semiotic offensive, right? Mm -hmm. And... And so that will always be there, that work in terms of environment, in terms of gender identity, right? In terms of rights. Uh, and, you know, let's say like right now we are talking about Afghanistan, right? How do I mobilize for the rights of Afghan women? I can't just say, let's theorize it from the point of view of Taliban, no. I have to infuse their rights with the 20 years of life that they have lived in which they have developed certain civic structures and part of it maybe comes from the West, part of it comes from Islam, right? But if I just go into purest Islamic logic of the Wahhabi movement, then I, then I can't argue on their behalf or not on their behalf, that would be too hubristic, but in solidarity with them. And I think post-colonialism allows us to do all that. This is an interesting question also, and I'm, I'm sort of thinking, is it a more, it probably is a more recent phenomenon where uh, India, um, and I'm thinking of some of the recent things I've seen on Twitter and social media where, you know, this idea of anti-colonial is then very problematically used and appropriated by a very uh, right-wing stat uh, status of things. And completely used to then spread that kind of Hindutva uh, hegemony. And same thing, as you mentioned that, you know, this whole Islamization of texts or ideology, but do you think it's in the current moment that is happening? Because I don't see that was happening so much in the eighties or even the nineties. Yeah, I, no, I think it's fairly new in terms of its expression, right? I mean, it was brewing in different cultures, this populist right-wing way of looking at the world. Uh, but, you know, like, I think it's Anthony D. Smith who talks about objective differences and then subjective expression of those differences. So in every culture, there are always fissures, right? Where we know that here are the fault lines. And then, then a group comes along or a, 
or politicians come along and then they mobilize that to a certain purpose, right? So if you look at India, this idea, I mean, Partha Chatterjee writes about it in Nation and Its Fragments, right? The whole idea of the proper woman and the westernized woman, it already existed in Bengali dramas and elsewhere, right? We already had that where if you looked like a Western woman, somehow you weren't Indian enough, right? But now, since politics have mo has mobilized that identity, they have Hinduized it, and then they have added gender to it. So, I mean, th think of the actions of people then. So I would say post 1990s, we have reached the climax of what neoliberalism unleashed, right? So what did it unleash in the early 80s and 70s was the, the abdication of the public sphere by the state and its institutions, right? And privatization of the public sphere. When you privatize the public sphere, the local and regional stakeholders, power holders, people who hold the symbolic power start creating their allegiances, right? People are disenfranchised. They don't have any money. They don't have any resources. And, and the government cannot do much about them. So who comes and appropriates their loyalties? These groups, right? Religious groups, culturally conservative groups, because they give them a sense of identity, a sense of power, right? And then when they are politicized, then you get what you have in India, you get what you have in Pakistan, what, what we have here in United States of America. And so, I mean, here is the thing with all kinds of conservatisms, I've always believed in that, is that conservative reactionary responses to the general norm are always, they always, are written on the bodies of women. Yeah. Because like one important aspect of modernity was that women break through and enter the public sphere, right? And conservative responses to modernity always wants to reinscribe women back in the private sphere, right? And, and so that's what we are seeing. So to not to be like too long in my answering. So I think the seeds of what we are seeing were already there, those fissures were there. And for reasons, economic and political post 1990s, we see, and also like fall of any kind of social, socialistic ways of looking at the world, right? Has kind of now morphed into this. And you certainly write about what we are seeing now in Texas is an expression of that too. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I want to look at the pandemic in the last one and a half years. And obviously, the it feels like the seams of the world are bursting everywhere in the ways um, we are imagining people marginalized or at the peripheries, um, how the borders are being reinforced again in mobilities being stopped. And in this kind of an environment where give or take, all lives are in a certain kind of crisis. What do you think is the role of literature and arts at a time when social, economic, political upheavals are everywhere around us? I mean, I think like to assume that we can have a revolutionary role would be problematic because we are assuming universal access to what we do, right? So part of the problem with the pandemic is that it has aggravated the digital divide, right? So if you have access to what you and I are doing, maybe you can be part of a conversation, but if you are in a tiny village in, uh, in Chittagong or you know, in Northern areas of Pakistan, you, you are already more isolated because you cannot access the world as you and me are doing. So on the other hand, I mean, the positive impact of it is that people have realized that their local communities need to be strengthened and they need to watch out for each other because no one else is there to take care of them, right? So that, now that can end up into a more liberatory politics, but also, you know, it, it can make people more insular. You know? So the very nature of this pandemic is, is that it is isolating, right? Mm -hmm. And, and that it, 
isolates people one from the other. And so the problem with that is that with the digital divide as it is, it isolates people who don't have access to these kind of resources even more, right? Mm -hmm. And we're also trying to deal with this pandemic in a world where most governments, especially the developing world governments, had already reduced their social functions and had privatized them. So Jaise, when you look at in India, you know, people were posting online, right? Mm -hmm. We need a oxygen cylinders, who has it? Like social media. Similarly in Pakistan, people were like pleading because the governments no longer had the resources to orchestrate a system like that. Absolutely. And same in United States, right? So I think the role of literature and literary studies now is to be strident, right? To point out now here, this is what happens when you make this world into this is mine and this is yours. When you make this world about, I'm gonna arrogate to myself all that I can because I have the power. When you don't build the safety net, when you don't maintain it, right? Uh, and when you divide the world on based on these lines on a piece of paper that says I'm Mexico, because the pandemic doesn't really care, right? It is transporter, it is international. And so that's what we should be pointing out and that how can we, the response be transnational, right? Right now in the United States, we have access of the vaccines because there are millions of people who don't want it. But in Bangladesh, in India, in Pakistan, there are people who are standing in lines to get it. If we had a more even global system of exchange, right? This problem shouldn't even exist, right? Vaccine, the vaccine should be available on a planetary scale. And I think that's what is our job to think and write and teach, right? Mm. As post-colonialists, I mean, uh, Spivak had talked about, talked about planetarity, what, about 25 years ago. So I think our job is even more important now as teachers, scholars, social media personalities and all to constantly talk about the failure of this way of nationalistic cis political system, but a global economy, which is privatized and the need for people to demand that more rigorous safety nets should be constructed. I want to stay with what you said regarding the digital access and the divide that the pandemic has also um, grievously shown to us, but in a way, and this is coming back to what you have created um, in your channel, The Postcolonial Space. First, I want to know if this was an endeavor that started during the pandemic or had it started before. And in a way, I and it, ironically, um, I had a student in Sweden and we talked about Can the Subaltern Speak? And you have been producing these videos. And I was you know, in a way it is also transnational and breaking down the borders. Uh, so your space, the post-colonial um, channel that you've created, talk to us about uh, the goals of it, if it was during the pandemic that you started it, and how has that changed the idea of scholarship or even your um, way of understanding a humanistic, humanistic scholar? So, I mean, I'd started it about a year before the pandemic, right? And the reason was that I felt, um, and of course there was a demand for it too. I felt like I needed to do more than just teaching at an institution and just writing my books and articles. So I started doing these live webinars, right? They were just basic rudimentary webinars and people from Pakistan, India, elsewhere will join them and we will decide a topic and talk about it. And when I saw people's interest there, I mean, look at the time zones. If I am giving a lecture at 10 o'clock in the morning over here, someone is sitting in Pakistan at seven o'clock in the evening, 6.30 in New Delhi, Morocco, Spain, so I realized, look, these people are dedicated enough to wake up, set up their time and come and talk to me. 
So maybe I should start developing materials that they can access whenever they want, if they have access to internet. So that's when I realized, okay, this is what I know, post-colonial studies, this is what I teach. So what is it that my students get over here, which the students in Islamabad might not? My way of explaining things, right? So I started developing, you know, just basic videos on what is post-colonialism, different theoretical terms on post-colonialism. And as I started doing that, what I realized that it had become a very selfish project and selfish in a sense, because I was getting so much recognition, right? From students all over the world. And you know how recognition is important for the stability of our own selves. So then I realized, oh, this is actually working. People are using it, they're finding it useful. And so then it kind of grew out of there into more and more literary theory. And then the pandemic happened. So when the pandemic happened, I realized, okay, I now need to start recording for my own students over here. So if I'm, I was teaching a course on literary theory, so I took the time to record those lectures which my students could use, but then also anyone else in the world with internet access could use it as well. And that taught me something about what we do, about the nature of public scholarship, right? Is that none of this counts towards our promotion or towards our tenure. Our colleagues, if you mention it in your annual report that I produced 300, 40 videos on post-colonialism, they'll probably laugh at you, right? <laughs> because for them, it is social media. But the true value of what we do in a way is, is a kind of a public service because people come to it and they can use it, right? And we get a chance to share a little bit of what we know with people who absolutely do not know us, who may not have qualified professors to teach this subject. Right. And in that sense, I have realized that this work that I've done over the last two years probably is, is more important in the long run in terms of my mission in the world, which is to share what I know, but also to help people think the world differently. I think this is more transformative than any of the books that I've written or any of the articles that I've written. And, and it has sustained me in so many ways, being in touch with so many people through this I medium. That it is being watched and used by just not students who don't have access. A lot of scholars, we get together and we talk about these videos and we have conversations about it. You know, I have- I will, you. I will tell you one of the leading French scholars and uh, he is in Quebec, he's from Canada. He is just publishing a book on belonging and exile. So he messaged me and said, I have watched your video on these, these topics. This is really a sophisticated undertaking. I want to cite it in my forthcoming book. Do you have a transcript of it? And I said, well, I don't, but I can publish a transcript of it on my website. And, I, and he actually cited that and this is the person who actually, you know, rubs shoulders with people like Spivak and Homi Baba, right? So that is like, how gratifying is that? Like knowing, I mean, you know, our profession tells us that doesn't count, right? <laughs> but, exactly. but you know how important for our own self in a way it is, especially when we are dealing with the, the impact of the pandemic and what it does to you when we are feeling our own insignificance at our jobs sometimes. So I see that as a deeply positive, positive thing. I want to end today's discussion with one final question to you. Um, if you had to pick, say, one text um, in a course that is a text that is a must read and a must teachable work, that should be taught, what would you choose and why? Okay, so is it fiction or theory? Can we do one fiction and one scholarly oh, one? I think that's oh, a fair fiction, question. Absolutely, I would uh, 
I would love to teach Ngugi Tiango's Devil on the Cross. Uh, the reason simply is, I mean, it's a realistic novel, but set in Kenya, and it deals with the traumas of the post-colony. How is it that every independence movement uh, wins their freedom under certain registers, under certain slogans, but then they are still caught within the web of economic power of the West, of the former colonies, and sometimes themselves corrupt, and then failure to deliver that promise to the people is what causes a lot of problems for the people. And I think the novel does a great job. It's also a great critique of how the colonial aesthetics impacts our way of seeing ourselves because our protagonist, Waringa, in the beginning of the novel is so deeply ingrained into the aesthetics of Europe that she irons her hair and she uses all these creams so that she becomes light skins, right? But then she light skins, so she moves away from that, not because of her own introspection, which usually is the ideal form of writing an individualistic novel, but because she meets these other people, workers, and someone, people who had fought in the independence movement. And through that solidarity then, by the end of the novel, she becomes this really autonomous figure, right? So the novel allows you to not just teach colonialism and post-colonial life, but also that instead of relying on that usually romantic idea of doing it yourself and finding your own humanity and your subjecthood, relying on lateral solidarities to do that. So that's why I include it pretty much in every post-colonial studies course. So in terms of theoretical works or scholarly works, once in our lives as scholars and teachers, we all should read the pedagogy of the oppressed. I will recommend it even if you are just teaching a course that deals with literary studies, but at least giving our students and ourselves an idea of how someone has thought through this concept of how pedagogy can be transformative and how it can be made to work for the students so that it becomes you know, an instrument of change. So these are the two books I will recommend. Thank you so much, Dr. Masood Raja for this conversation. All right, and thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm really delighted that I was able to do this.